Today we're going to continue talking about volcanoes and volcanic activity and specifically we're going to focus a little bit more on the volcanic landforms that form and how they form and what they look like. Uh, you're looking at a photo right here that I took uh, when I was in New Zealand a few years back and uh, this is a picture of, I'll try and get the name right here, Mount Naaruhoe. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge mountain, uh, it's a volcano. Uh, and it's located in New Zealand. Uh, this was the same mountain that they filmed uh, Mount Doom for in Lord of the Rings. So if you've seen those videos, uh, those movies, this is this is Mount Doom. And what's kind of neat is the day that we hiked out there, uh, my wife and I and two of our friends, there was this crazy like uh, fog that had rolled in across the mountain. And we'd been hiking all morning to get back far enough in to find this, this uh, volcano. Uh, and then it just kind of rose up out of the mists. It was very otherworldly, very cool. But you can see on the ground there, uh, that's all volcanic, uh, bits of volcanic tuff, uh, basalt, uh, little bits of ash. Um, it's a very, very volcanic landscape. There's really no plants uh, growing save for those tiny little things that are clinging to life there. Climbing up to the top of that thing was something else. I'll show you a picture here in a second. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk landforms, and the first one uh, has to do with that mountain that I just showed you, and it's called a caldera. A caldera is a large depression uh, in the top, usually in the top part of a volcano. Uh, they're, they're typically almost perfectly circular, and they form when all the magma gets evacuated out of the magma chamber, and then the ceiling of the magma chamber collapses, forming this big like circular depression right in the top of a volcano. So any volcano you've ever drawn as a kid in school or seen pictures of, like in like artistic pictures of, is probably got a caldera on top. It's like a big opening on the top. It looks like something's going to uh, spew out of it. Um, but there doesn't have to be. There's not like liquid material underneath of there. And sometimes they fill in with with water and create a crater lake at the top of a volcano. So anyway, that's a caldera, and uh, it took us hours to hike to the top of this thing. It was so slippery. But at the top of Mount Doom, Mount Nagaruhe, uh, there is a huge caldera. And there's a picture of me standing. Uh, it was hard to get a photo because the mist kept clouding everything over. And it's kind of hard to tell scale, but that thing is huge. It is like hundreds of feet down there. At the very bottom, you can see a little patch of ice down there. It was cold up there. Um, so uh, it had you had I fallen over that ledge, and that's some just some very, very uh, crumbly scoria there on the top. Um, had any of that broken off and I tumbled down, there would have literally been no way I could have crawled out of that. Um, it's, it's a little hard to tell from this angle, but the, the walls past a little bit are just they're just vertical, and it just goes hundreds of feet down. Uh, but it was something else to see. Um, a caldera right up and close like that. So that was all filled with magma at one point in time that erupted out of this volcano when it last blew up. And uh, then the top collapsed and you got this perfect circle like that, perfect uh, uh, cavity. Uh, look, look at some other forms. There are things called lava plateaus. Sometimes these are called steps. They can be humongous. Uh, this is any place where you have very fluid, typically basaltic lava, because that's the fluid, the liquidy stuff. Uh, it's very black, uh, getting extruded through usually fissures in the Earth's crust. So uh, there'll be these long kind of curtain eruption looking things that, that open up uh, and just loads and loads of lava spews out. And then it just floods across uh, a flat surface and they're, they're sometimes called flood basalts. Uh, but it makes a very big flat lava plateau. And here's a picture of an erupting fissure and so you can imagine lots and lots of those opening up along a segment of something, uh, you'd create a tremendous amount of magma or lava that would come out and just flood across the surface and make these big flat open expanses of volcanic rock. Now what happens if it cools beneath the surface? Well, if rock cools beneath the surface, the magma will become what we call a pluton. So that's any in igneous rock, intrusive igneous rock, it didn't make it out to the surface, uh, that results from the cooling and hardening of magma underneath the earth. So remember, when it gets extruded, when it gets erupted, we call it lava, and when it stays underneath and cools, we call it magma. Uh, so there's lots of different types of these plutons. 
Uh, there's, we're going to talk about a couple of different types here, and you're going to match some of them in the, in the quiz that you take. Uh, but they're classified mostly according to their shapes uh, and their size and what they do to the surrounding rock. So let's go over a few of those. The first two are sills and laccoliths. A sill, uh, well, well, first of all, both of these are horizontal to the Earth's surface. So they're, they're kind of flat to the Earth's surface as you're looking at them. Um, both of these things happen underground. So a sill happens when uh, the magma melts its way between rock layers um, and then hardens back up there underneath the ground. And these things can form these really cool structures known as columnar joints. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of some of these. They're really neat looking. Uh, so this is actually, this is all typically a basaltic uh, magma that's forming these. A laccolith is really similar to a sill. It's a horizontal shaped sort of thing, and it melts its way between two rock layers. But uh, instead of completely melting away the rock, the pressure from the magma forces the ground upwards and makes like a bulge there. So when this all this kind of cools, it looks more like a lens shape, like it's, it's bulged in the middle. Um, rather than just being a flat layer between some other layers. Uh, but other than that, they're pretty similar looking. Let's look at some uh, columnar jointing of basalt. Uh, this is in um, Iceland. I can remember get my country straight here. So in Iceland, uh, on the shore of the ocean here, um, that's me sitting in my rain jacket, it's pretty cold out, on top of some columnar basalt. So all of that basalt that's on the surface there used to be beneath the ocean and it was extruded out between some different layers and then hardened into this giant sill and as it cooled sometimes it cracks in these crazy hexagonal sort of patterns uh, and we call that columnar jointing because it cracks downwards in that bizarre shape. It looks like somebody made those things. Look at the little stairs. Um, in fact, Giant's Causeway in Ireland is uh, columnar basalt. Uh, really cool looking stuff. Really neat. Some of my favorite uh, types of rock formations right there. A sill might look something along these lines right here. So you can see this one's exposed to the surface. It's a little blurry, but uh, the white line is outlining uh, the injected uh, magma there where it cooled. And then uh, it formed that extra structure that wouldn't have been there underneath all that rock. Okay, let's move on to what's known as a dike. So dikes are a tabular shaped intrusive rock again. So this, instead of cutting horizontally through the rock, uh, it goes more vertically or even at an angle, but it cuts across pre-existing rock layers. So if you think of like underneath the earth or surface, we've got layer after layer after layer of rocks. Dikes cut across all those layers rather than going in between them like sills and laccoliths do. Um, so these happen usually when you've got a big magma chamber and the magma, magma pushes outwards and invades like other cracks that are going across rock layers um, in the surrounding rocks. I'll show you a kind of a drawing of this here in a minute. Let's turn now to the batholith. These are humongous structures. Um, this is when a, a big massive amount of igneous rock gets formed uh, deep underground. So basically we're talking about a magma chamber uh, down underneath the earth that cools and crystallizes. It's known as a batholith when enough material wears away off the surface and it gets lifted up um, and then the cooled rock is all exposed on the surface. Uh, they've got to be pretty big to be called a batholith. Um, to give you an example, some mountain ranges themselves are batholiths. Like, so these are humongous structures. The entire mountain, and probably as far back as we could see in the picture, if we could see over it, is all one batholith. So they can be humongous. Let's look at a picture or a diagram here of some of those structures make a little bit more sense. So, uh, uh, so at the top right over there, I guess is where it starts, you've got a magma chamber, big, huge, large body of magma, and it's erupting out of a volcano there. Uh, you've got various little cracks in the rock layers where it's injected itself, either along the layers themselves or up across them. Uh, I've got a place there where it's erupting in a fissure where the ground is pulled apart and you've got a big eruption going on. Uh, and some little cones uh, happening there. Uh, down to the next page, or I'm sorry, the next picture to the left, uh, you can see what happens after it cools off. So underneath the ground, that big magma chamber became the batholith. The sills are the horizontal layers that are between all the other rock layers that were there to begin with, whereas the dikes are the things that went 
cut across them up towards the surface. And he's got little volcanic necks labeled there from the, one of the volcanoes. Um, looking at the bottom picture to the bottom right, you can see what it looks like when it's eroded away and that batholith has been lifted up. You've got this humongous like mountain range there because that batholith is pretty hard stuff to erode and the surrounding rock eroded away from it. So those are how the igneous landforms tend to form. Let's talk a little bit about magma. Geologists uh, understand that magma originates mostly when solid rock that's in the crust in the upper mantle gets partially melted. Now the the obvious way to do that is to put it deep because the deeper you are uh, in the Earth's crust, the hotter the temperature is, right? Um, the only problem is, well, there's kind of a problem with that because uh, even as you go deeper, it does get hotter, but it doesn't get hot enough to technically melt the rock um, without a little bit of help. So let's sort of look at kind of where that comes from. So there's something known as the geothermal gradient that we've done a little lab over, and that is just the fact that the Earth's temperature increases, the temperature increases as you go deeper. So temperature increases with depth. Um, but like I said, this isn't really enough to melt rock all on its own just because it gets hotter as it goes down, um, at least in the lower crust and the upper mantle. If you get much deeper than that, then yeah, it's probably hot enough to melt some stuff. Um, so to melt the actual rock, what you need is a little bit of additional heat, and that happens because as that rock's forced downwards, there's a lot of friction at those subduction zones where the one plate's being pushed underneath another plate. Um, we also have areas of the mantle where there's really hot material, plumes rising upward, and that can melt the overlying rocks without any subduction going on at all. Uh, so along with those things, there is a really important um, additional characteristic that helps with melting, and that's water. So water uh, plays a role uh, in a sense acting as what we call a flux. So you'd put a flux on, say, something you were welding or soldering because you wanted it to melt easier. So this is a material, water's a material, that actually lowers the temperature at which rocks melt. So that makes them easier to melt, right? If you lower the temperature to melt the rock, you don't have to get it as deep to melt it. Ah, right? So uh, water can be very helpful, and this really plays a big role when you've got a subducting oceanic plate, because it's a plate in the ocean. It's got a lot of water, like the rock is wet with water. Um, and as it goes down, it's dragging sediments and things from the surface that are impregnated with water with it and that makes it melt easier. It lowers the melting temperature, and so you get stuff that gets erupted at the surface. Okay, let's turn now to the types of boundaries, or, or convergent boundaries in particular, and what happens when you get different uh, plate boundaries converging. So remember, we can have a boundary that's ocean material, oceanic crust, or we can have a boundary that's continental crust, and you get different scenarios depending on what happens when two of those meet. If an ocean meets an ocean, or if an ocean meets a continent, or if a continent meets a continent, uh, which I don't have, think I have a picture of on here, or uh, don't think I have a bullet point for it. So uh, what occurs? So pretty much any time any two plates meet, you're going to have volcanism. You're going to have heating of rock, and some plate is going to usually get subducted underneath another plate. When an ocean plate meets an ocean plate, the older ocean plate always gets pushed underneath the younger one. And w the reason for that is that the rock in the older plate, it's cooler because it's had more time to cool off, and it's heavier, partly because of that and partly because there's more sediment sitting on top of it. And uh, it gets forced underneath the younger one. So as it gets forced underneath in an ocean-to-ocean's convergence, ocean-to-ocean -ocean convergence, you get all of these volcanic island arcs that form. And the Aleutian Islands are a great example of that. Now what happens when an ocean meets a continent? The oceanic plate is always heavier than the continental plate, and it will get pushed underneath the continental plate. And as it gets pushed down, the oceanic plate that's pushed underneath starts to melt um, and heat up the rock above it, and that rock melts, and then it erupts and forms volcanic uh, continental arcs, so the, con the volcanoes form on the continent, not out in the ocean. 
And the Andes Mountain is a, Mountains are a really good example of that. We've got a subducting plate there, and then all along that coast is a whole chain of mountains. Uh, the last one that's I don't think I have a picture I don't have on my bullet points here is when you have a continent converge with a continent, and the Himalayan uh, mountains are a really good example of that because where India has collided with the rest of Asia, it's forced all those mountains up there. Uh, since both both plates are about the same density, uh, they force themselves both upwards and downwards, and you don't have so much of a subduction event as you have a crunching crinkling event. And those mountains can get humongously tall right, because of that. Let's look at a volcano here on a convergent uh, plate boundary here. I'm not sure which volcano this is. I didn't take this picture, but um, yeah, you get volcanoes whether along the in the ocean or on land at different converging boundaries. All right, the greatest volume of volcanic rock is produced along the oceanic ridge system. Remember I told you before that if we were to evaporate all the water out of Earth's oceans, the, the oceanic ridges, the mid-oceanic ridges, would be the most striking feature of our planet. They're humongous. They wrapped around the entire planet. They're giant mountain ranges with this huge fissure in, in between all of them uh, where new material is pouring out, basalt is pouring out. So uh, the majority of new rock that's make, come forming out of vol volcanic systems is actually happening uh, in the centers of the oceans. And it's pulling and pushing the lithosphere apart there. Um, okay, so uh, lots and lots of basaltic magma is being made. That's new ocean floor. Now, Iceland is sitting on top of a hot spot that is on top of the mid-oceanic ridge. Uh, so there is just a tremendous amount of material flowing out there. Let's talk about intraplate volcanism because it's kind of unique. Uh, Volcanoes don't have to happen at a plate boundary, like the ones we just talked about, where two plates are meeting or where plates are diverging and, and forming the mid-ocean ridge system. They can happen smack dab in the middle of a plate. Uh, and a good example of that is actually Hawaii. So Hawaii is situated over a very hot spot, smack dab in the middle of the Pacific plate, and the magma is quite literally burning its way through to the surface and comes spilling out onto the ocean floor and making mound after mound after mound till it breaks through the top of the water and then you've got an island. So the whole chain of Hawaiian islands one after another is a system where the plate has moved over the hot spot which is down in the mantle and it's burned through another location. So at any point in time, there's only one Hawaiian island that's actually active volcanically. The rest of them are all just slowly wearing away. And right now, I think the next Hawaiian island is just starting to form off of the main island of Hawaii. Um, so that's just a continual process. We can trace it all the way back millions of years as that plate's moved across that hot spot. Um, there, this can also occur smack dab in the middle of a continental plate. Uh, we have a, a big intraplate volcanism area right in Yellowstone, which you can watch a video about. So there is actually a, old super volcanoes that have occurred in Yellowstone area, and they probably will occur again in the future. And there is some very hot material underneath there. Uh, is it a hot spot? Um, it, it might be a hot spot because of material in the mantle. Uh, there's been some recent speculation that there's actually a, a plate that's pinched off underneath of there. Uh, that's that's melting down there in the in the mantle and creating some plume really hot plumes that are coming up and uh, coming through the surface there. But it is a very active site. If you ever get a chance to go to Yellowstone, there there are hot springs all over the place. There's geysers. Uh, it is volcanic for sure. Um, here's a picture of uh, Kilauea, uh, of course, which is over in the Hawaiian Islands, and you see an active uh, volcano there. Okay, that's it for today, guys. Go ahead and complete your quiz, and you're all done.